Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we've got a great interview tonight because you all know how much I love retro video games, and uh, our guest tonight is Mike Kennedy from uh, Retro Media. Is that right, Mike? Retro Media Network, yes. Retro Media Network, and yep. uh, behind him right now is an Apple IIc, which was my first computer, which was awesome. Now, what's funny is, is Mike is really like living the dream here that I've always wanted to have, which is to have my own magazine and my own game console. He's done both uh, in this century, so it's so bizarre to like launch a magazine in, in 2013, whenever you launched it. Uh, it's been successful, it's covering retro games, uh, and now we've got the retro VGS game console that you're also launching, so we're gonna be talking all about this stuff. Uh, let's start with the magazine, though. Give us a little mm -hmm. background. What does it cover? And, and it looks really modern, but it's covering retro and retro-inspired games, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, um, first of all, the only retro magazine in the U.S. Um, there's another great retro magazine that'll, that a lot of us know, uh, Retro Gamer in the U.K., um, and, you know, we really just wanted to bring back a magazine, a print magazine, first and foremost. Um, I know people say magazines are kind of on the outs, but I don't know if you've been to a Barnes & Noble lately. There's still a ton of magazines, right? And so, um, you know, but, but a lot of people question it. Like, why would you come out with a print magazine in this day and age, you know, when everything's kind of going digital? And, and certainly gamers are kind of always on that cutting edge of the digital space. So why not just do it digital? And... Um, I don't know. A digital magazine doesn't excite me. It never right. did. Uh, they don't excite me to this day. I mean, I, I'd rather just own the dang magazine, right? And so, you know, we had this idea to do this, uh, this video game magazine a couple years ago. We did a Kickstarter for it, and I went out and kind of recruited um, some of my friends in the industry and some that um, um, I didn't know at that time. Uh, but were, but was connected to via other people and whatnot. And so, you know, I wanted to bring on kind of an all-star cast of writers um, from different decades of gaming and kind of blend them all together kind of into this all-star list of journalists and, and gamers and, and personalities to, uh, you know, write about uh, retro video games. And not only games that, that are, that you know, that are old, but also, um, over the last few years, as we know, there's just been tons of great retro, new retro games, uh, new games being developed in that retro. Uh, Those become know, a genre in of itself, right? It is. It really yeah. is, right? And so, um, I kind of saw that all coming together um, at E3 a couple of years ago, when you know a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo invited. I mean you know, third party, small, independent game company, you know, game developers, one or two person teams uh, onto their floor to show off their game. And when I saw that, I thought, OK, we're this is the time for all of this to happen, the magazine. And ultimately, that's kind of what kind of forced us into to kind of doing the console at this time. And and so it's just the time was right. And, you know, there's lots of things to write about, whether it's old games or new games that are coming out that were inspired by old games. Um, and so Retro Magazine really celebrates, um, you know, the, the, kind of that whole retro gaming scene, whether it's old or new and it kind of everything in between. And and um, there's just literally there's going to be stories in here you're not going to find online. Um you know, people are like, well, you can read everything online these days. Well, no, you can't. <laughs> you right, know, so you really can't. Leaking through that magazine, too. Is really yeah, cool. and so, we're, you know, we try to get really, we got tons of great connections uh, in various aspects of the industry, and, and there's really no person that's in the industry that's famous that's out of reach from any of us. We know everybody. Right. And so I always thought with, with the connections I've developed through my podcasts and stuff over the years, and, and then some of the more contemporary younger guys that we got on that, that, you know, I'm kind of the Atari era guy, and then we've got, you know, some NES era and then some Sony, you know, PS1 era guys and and you know just trying to set all of this stuff's getting old you know every you know faster and faster by the minute right i mean think of how old the ps1 is it, wow, it, it's yeah, crazy 20 years this, this year right I mean, I, <laughs> it's well crazy. it's funny i was doing I, I got the uh the virtual boy behind me there and and uh i was like you know i was in college when i tried this out it was like 1995 well, that was 20 years ago like my 3do in the next room too and it's amazing like just how fast uh, time has flown on all this stuff, yeah, and, and yeah, you know it's getting yeah. older, right? I mean, these things are going to start to break, and and I get, you the really have to keep modern up, right? day systems are, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's no way around it. I mean, the motors, you know, anything with a motor in it uh, is going to break. Anything that pings a server uh, is going to be a brick in the future. So, um, 
so anyway, yeah, so so we started the magazine. Uh, well, I did Game Gavel first, which is the auction site, which okay. has kind of been sputtering over the years. But it, uh, GameGavel.com is still the only dedicated gaming auction site in the world. And uh, we, you know, we have new people try it every day. There's stuff bought and sold on it every day. Um, it's free to list, and and so that's what I that's what started this back in '08. And, and then, did you have like uh, an interest in this before? I mean, were you a big gamer? I was just a collector. Okay. You know, I bought and sold stuff on eBay all the time. Went to the uh, swap meets here in California. And like a lot of us, you know, you buy stuff, you sell stuff to finance your collection. Um, and and so I, I was using eBay a lot. And then, you know, it got to that. There was that sort of weird time when eBay started doing a lot of weird stuff. Right. And kind of ticking a lot of people off. And I just right. thought, hell, screw it. I'm going to go out and start my own auction right. site. So, uh, so we started Game Gavel, which started out as ChaseTheChuckWagon.com for anybody that might have been there way back. Okay. Um, <laughs> a little, and, little unrelated um, name to the service, though, right? Yeah, right, yeah. right. And so, um, and you know, it's been doing pretty well. And um, But it's not been growing by leaps and bounds. I've not had a lot of money to promote it. And uh, But now that the magazine's come along and has really kind of bolstered this whole uh, network, uh, we're up to, you know, around 40,000 people circulation right now we're in Barnes and Noble uh, we got subscribers in over 35 countries and uh, people are just really loving getting a print magazine you know delivered to their house again it makes the mailbox fun again right oh yeah, yeah. and um, and I so think, it's just been it's been going great that's great because I think back to when I was a kid like I you know those game magazines I look forward to every month when they came out I remember going to I had a this is funny I had a cable access show when I was 13 and I had no idea I, I wanted a TV show I didn't know what I wanted to be of uh, and I went out and found um, you know one of these magazines at the newsstand, and I just plowed through that cover to cover. It was pretty uh, pretty uh, cool to just to see coverage of something that I was really interested in. So I think there is some value to that, you know, sifting through. Yeah, the yeah, and you know we have a different artist to create every cover, you know, so it's always going to look a little bit different, and look cool. We've had some great, we work with some great artists. Uh, we're just uh, you know getting ready to publish issue nine in August, um, and so every cover is really cool and kind of collectible and. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're pretty collectible. I mean, you can go onto eBay right now and, and uh, just kind of a tip if anybody likes collecting magazines. Every phone in my house is running right now. <laughs> You're a popular guy. Yeah. 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 Um, literally, it went from this one to this one to that yeah, one. I, it's all the know, same person. I, I, it's all I the have same this person. issue with like the, the, the Apple thing that now rings everything and then my Google Voice you know, takes over and it's like, yeah. you, you think like World War Three is starting up. So I, yeah, I sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, um, oh yeah, so um, just so just a little bit of a tip. Our first six issues, uh, we only produced um, 3,500 copies of each. So uh, those first six issues are, are getting to be really hard to find right now. Um, the premier issue, uh, which has uh, got Mighty Number no. Nine on the cover, I think is selling anywhere from like fifty to hundred dollars, which is wow. crazy. Um, and so again, one through six are going to be really limited and hard to find. Uh, there's a bunch of them always up on eBay, not a bunch, you know, maybe five to seven or eight, you know, different auctions running at any one time, it seems like for the back issues. And, uh, but starting with issue seven, uh, which was our mortal Kombat issue and then uh, our Batman issue that we just did. And then our upcoming, uh, metal gear kind of history of, of, uh, uh, stealth games and that whole genre. Uh, those are printing upwards around thirty to forty thousand, so they're going to be a little easier, a little easier to find. But if yeah. you're into collecting magazines, uh, we have lots of people, you know, uh, trying to find the older issues. That's cool. So you've already so, started. Well, I guess if you're catering to collectors to some degree, that's what they do, right? They collect and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, every issue's got a glossy UV coated cover. You know, they're meant to collect and to save, and they're resource material. There's lots of great and cool interviews in there, and uh, previews and reviews, and and um, a lot of historical stuff and collector guides that uh, we uh, Chris Kohler does for me and and uh, yeah it's just been a whole lot of fun um, and uh, it, it's going well it's that's going terrific. well so oh, that's excellent so, so that was sort of the that's the, the first, first thing step. right yeah and then what so now so you go from making a magazine which is not easy in of itself right because you got to get the do designer you got to print it four color yeah printing right is I never published a magazine before I mean I was gonna do a digital magazine yeah. when I was approached by uh, at, at the time my my partner at, at the time who's no longer with me but he's like let's do a print magazine I was like mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Um, don't know anything about this, but, um, you know, it sputtered a little bit. You know, we kind of got d d behind in some delays. We had some um, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, it was a startup, right? right. I mean, we, we produced a magazine in January and the Kickstarter ended in no, middle of, no, you know, early November. Right. So, I mean, That's I don't know any company yeah. that could have done that. Right. You know, so right. we really did pretty well. Although, you know, we kind of, we, in the summer, we got slow. We missed a month. A lot of the people were, 
you know, consumed with E3 and, and a lot of my writers and stuff, and that added to some delays. And, and uh, so, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a great experience for me. I mean, I never ever thought my wildest dreams I'd ever be a publisher of a magazine. But uh, hey, you it just are. shows you if, you. if you got an idea, anybody that's listening, I mean, go out there and go for it, man. I mean, it's, it's really rewarding. It's great. And, um, you know, you, you rely and call upon, um, you know, other people to help you out and, uh, and, and things like that. So, you now know, you're, so far, now you're every good. Barnes and Noble in the country are just about, right? So it's, it's pretty much, yeah. Do you think the, the, the whole, you know, the whole internet era where it's so much easier now to find people who share your interests, did that help? Oh, you know? yeah, without a doubt. I mean, whether you're just a hobbyist or a collector or you're professional, there's so many ways you can network these days that you couldn't before. I mean, I'm networking on this console side with publishers, with developers, with other iconic developers, with, you know, people in Japan. I mean, it, it goes on and on. It's invaluable. Because it's amazing. I, I follow all the retro gamer people on YouTube. And, you know, you can, you can tell just by the viewership numbers is that it, it, it's not a huge, huge audience. It's huge. It's big. But it's not like, you know, what you would see for, you know, perhaps a Microsoft or a Sony console or something. But uh, yeah. they're all out there and they're very passionate and they're all willing to spend a lot of money on this stuff. So I think it seems like there's a lot of real, you know, tangible interest out there. So that, that brings us to the game console. You're going from... Yeah. Now it's you know not easy to do a magazine, but you know you've got printers and people you can work with. Now you're making hardware, <laughs> the uh, yeah. the game console. I'm gonna pull this up. So tell us what this is because this looks like an Atari Jaguar, doesn't it? It well, it looks like it because it is an Atari Jaguar shell. Okay. Um, that's really what's made this whole thing possible for me. This is you know this is one of the points of contention. Some people love it, some people hate it. You know we all know the history of the Jaguar for the most part. It didn't have the greatest history in the in the world of, of gaming. Um, and um, but for whatever reason, the tooling was never thrown out. Um, it was kept around. It was repurposed as this dental you know the dental instrument and. And uh, so, I don't know, it was maybe three years ago, uh, there was a discussion in Atari Age um, in the Jaguar forums there about this Jaguar tooling that had been put up on eBay. And so the company that put it up on eBay was Imagine Systems, this dental company who bought them from Atari in the late 90s when Atari was going through um, some sort of a liquidation of some sort. And actually, what's interesting is the injection mold house that the dental company used for its products was the same injection molding company that was building or, or uh, uh, you know, popping out the, the, uh, the Jaguar shells. And so the, it was the injection mold company that got wind that Atari was going kind of under it to some extent and they went to imagine systems and said they're getting rid of this tooling and this product is very similar to the product that, that the dental company was already making surprisingly enough it almost looked identical to it it was crazy and uh, so anyway to make a long story short dental company bought it from atari 98 and uh made some products out of it over the course of you know of time and then you know many years ago they uh because of technology that that product line kind of fell by the wayside and and they put the tooling up on eBay. They never sold it. Uh, they were talking about and kind of threatening to, um, you know, uh, they were threatening to, you know, melt it down and recycle it and stuff like that. And, um, but he never did. You know, he kept it. And uh, basically, uh, Steve Mortensen, the owner of Imagine, ultimately told me that he appreciated the design and, and just couldn't couldn't bring himself to destroy that tooling. You know, sooner or later, there'd be some crazy person coming by that are. would want to buy this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he had been approached many times uh, over the years for people to buy this. And ultimately, nobody ever did because, I mean, it's 9,000 pounds of steel. Right. Where are you, you going to put it? How are you going to ship it? You know, all of these types of things. So it didn't really make sense. You've got a great video, by the way, on your Facebook page of this whole process of checking out the stuff when you first yes, met with the guy yeah. and, and yeah. then getting it on the truck and you have the actual injection molds operating. So this is yeah. pretty cool stuff. Like to see yeah, I mean, every uh, part of I've this. been trying to document, I mean, that's part of this whole process, being very transparent with uh, the fans of this system, you know, because it's, you know, ultimately it's their, it's their system, it's my system, it's, it's everybody's system. And, and we all want, you know, we're trying to get as much input as we can you know, one thing with gamers, you're never going to appease everybody, right? It's right. Uh, it's really difficult. We're they're a real outspoken bunch, and if you're discerning customers too, I found. Um, yeah, you can't. I mean, you really have to have every I and, and T <laughs> taken care Definitely. of. Definitely, you know, and you're not going to please everybody, yeah. but you know, we've got some great people on my team. We're all retro gamers at heart. Um, you know, we're doing this to, you know, bring that culture back. 
um, which we feel is still important, you know, even for younger gamers who haven't, haven't grown up with cartridges and are kind of getting shoehorned into this digital downloadable, you know, patch ridden, uh, industry that currently is, you know, which really kind of sucks for them. Right, um, you know, I'll just trying what, to say like, at least I boot up my Xbox one, like maybe once at once or twice a month at that. And yeah. I never play the damn thing because it's always updating something. There's a 20 gigabyte thing here. There's this or that. I can never actually use the game console in the time that I have because it's constantly yeah. up. So this is not an internet connected device then. It's not going to be internet connected. And you know, the whole reason is because, I mean, you can't, we don't want to have a device that's got to ping a server in 20 years or 10 years or five years. I mean, right. and brick it. Right. You know, I mean, eventually, you know, all of these systems that people are playing today are going to be bricks. Right. It's going to happen. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to play an Xbox 360 or an Xbox One, probably. Uh, certainly the next generation of consoles, which are probably all going to be cloud based, you're not going to be able, you know, unless they have some extraordinarily long life. Which that's not the way the industry is, right? I mean, it's right, always so trying to, to better one. itself to the next one, and and so you know we're not all about that. What we're about is giving at least for people that enjoy the retro game, the style of games, the look of those games, the gameplay mechanics of those games, the ability to to continue to play these games uh, in a different option. Like this is the fourth system. You know, if you want to play one of these great, you know, shovel knights or rezo gun or whatever. And I'm just pulling these out of thin air kind right. of, but you know, they're really only available to, to stream or to download. Right. Um, and I don't want to buy a PS4 to play a gun. Now, if I could buy it on a $50 yeah. cartridge and play it in a console that I know I can play it on forever, I'm going to buy that all day long. With a good controller know. and everything else, right? You know, the experience you're going to have. Yeah, right. You know, and, and retro games, even though they're retro, I mean, they require a certain amount of precision, you know, with a controller that you're not generally going to get with a touchscreen. You're not going to get with a wireless controller typically because of lag time and everything else. So, you know, that's why we're doing USB controllers, um, you know, no Internet connectivity. Um, hey, games are going to have to work right out of the box. Imagine that. <laughs> and never be patched. So they got to be And never be patched, perfect. right. right. So, so none of this Batman, you know, what is that Batman game that just came out? It's all yeah, messed up, PC right? Yeah, all messed up. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy. And, you know, generally the games that are going to be coming out on this aren't going to be, you know, massive, you know, aren't going to require massive teams to make. And I think a lot of it is, you, know, you get so many, you just get too many chefs, you know, you get too many people working on something, you know, thousands of people in some of these teams shit falls through the cracks right you know right. <laughs> and that's just the way it is and, yeah. and you know luckily game companies have trained the consumer to, to kind of patch, be patch, their, patch. their 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 test their testers right you know which is just i don't get it you know right. i mean they they do have huge budgets they're spending tons of money on these they should be able to make a game that works and uh you know somebody goes and spends 60 bucks on it they're excited they come home they rip it open or they you know, take five hours to download the damn thing, and then it just doesn't work. And that's the thing that gets me. It's like you get this Xbox that. game out, you put it, you put the disc in, and you're sitting there while it copies 20 gigabytes to your, your hard drive. I mean, I remember a day I had the, the we, we were talking before we started, the ColecoVision. I mean, that was, the, I came home from school one day, my father found some game at a store cheap, he threw it to yeah. me, and I popped it in the console and played it for an hour. There wasn't any setup. It. Yeah, got into it. It was yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, now when you buy a, even a new game system, I mean, from the time you bring it home and unbox it to the time you're actually playing a game, it's usually like one to two hours. Yeah, the Wii U in particular. I, I did a, yeah. I I wrote, a, I wrote an article about, like, it was yeah. many words about if you don't want to ruin Christmas for your kid, plug yeah, it right. in before. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if I read one that did that. Maybe it was yours because somebody, I, I remember reading exactly that same thing. Yeah, get it and get it all set up and updated before you, you give it to them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just kind of crazy right now. And I don't want to knock the current game industry. I mean, you know, that's it's they're doing some, you know, very awesome things and it, it's, you know, it's a great industry and there's great games coming out and there's great people working on them and everything. So, um, you know, it's just a different time and and the technology's changed and uh, for better or for worse, right? Right. And um but we don't have to have that. There there mm -hmm. can be a third op or a fourth option and that is right. is Retro VGS and, and again, you you buy it, you plug it in, you put the cartridge in it, you turn it on, no load times, it comes on, you start playing, you know, you give a controller to your buddy sitting next to you, you sit down, you play games for three or four hours, and you love it. Um, and so, you know, that that's kind of that, that's kind of where it's at. And the Jag, you know, that me purchasing those that tooling for what I did, which was next to nothing, you know, really uh, made it possible. So if you like it, if you don't like it, 
Um, it's, it is what it is. Without it, I wouldn't be launching the retro VGS. Right, if I didn't have you know two three hundred thousand dollars to throw at development and design and and uh, tooling costs and everything else. So that's literally what this saved us in startup. And, and people don't even really realize just how complicated it is just to design the plastic casing because there's engineering, there's those, these molds. I was watching these videos that you, you put up of this of yeah. this construction. It's just mind boggling. Now, when we yeah. talk about a retro console, um, this is not just a you know going to play your Atari games. This is not an emulation thing per, per se. Right. This is so so you've got an ARM chip in here that's probably is it comparable with a lot of the mobile processors out there right now so it, it can play yeah. newer stuff but that's still retro yeah. in, in design is yeah. that the target yeah 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 so our system um you know we've not real like the revealed like major specifications of this thing yet we're still we're just buttoning it up right now so hopefully it's going to be forthcoming but um you know to put it simply we've got kind of a dual system working here we've got what's called an fpga system um and then the the, the arm core and, and um so the fpga is a really interesting aspect of this thing no console has ever done this um you know there's there's some hobbyist boards out there that are using the fpga you know if you're you know kind of uh, in the the techie, nerdy, geeky crowd, you understand this stuff. I mean, it's expensive. I mean, these boards are a few hundred dollars just for a bare board. And so, you know, our task has been trying to bring this technology into a consumer product. And uh, it's just tough because it's never been done. It's just, it's still expensive technology. Um, and what the FPGA allows us to do is basically reconfigure our console uh, to whatever system we want it to reconfigure in hardware. So um, you do this through cores that have been written for most of the 8-bit systems and 8-bit PCs. So, I mean, there's Amiga cores and Commodore cores and um, there's probably Atari cores. I know there's, um, you know, Atari, uh, I think 2600, 2700 cores and Intellivision, ColecoVision cores, NES cores, Master System cores. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Kevin Horton, Keptris, a lot of your guys may know that is sort of the kind of premier expert in FPGA uh, gaming as it's, uh, as it's using gaming technology. He's kind of the guru about that and has written a lot of these cores. And, and so we're working with Kevin and, uh, you know, may, maybe the MIST team. Um, we don't want to steal these cores. You right, know, you we don't want to pull license. a retron and, right. and go out and steal these things. And, and, and so, we're, you know, we're really and we don't want to reinvent the wheel at the same time. Right. So we're trying to, you know, basically work a deal with them with some sort of a licensing agreement where we use use their cores that are already existed or uh, like for 16-bit cores, the Genesis stuff, the SNES cores, uh, they've not really been made yet. The Neo Geo cores haven't been made yet. So this might be a good um, opportunity to kind of introduce those things. To yeah, so we may, you know, market. once we know that we're funded and this thing is a go, you know, we may commission Kevin just to launch off into the Super NES cores and then onto the Genesis cores. And what these cores will allow developers to do is to, um, we're doing it, you know, again, not to emulate and play old games. But to give like uh, real high quality homebrew developers, a lot of these guys and, and probably girls that are making um, new games for the Genesis or new games to play on the SNES on original hardware. Um, and they know how to make these games, right? They know the tool chains and right. they know what they're doing. And, and so uh, giving them an opportunity to not have to like relearn something, we want to make it really easy for, for those types of program or game developers to just simply continue to make the games the way they're doing it. But instead of releasing it on a ge uh, Genesis cartridge and selling it to a few hundred people kind of in the hobby world, you know, hopefully we can take it to a much bigger audience. You know, because, hey, there's this new console that plays right. these games that are similar to what I grew up with. You know, they're family friendly, probably for the most part. <laughs> and, and you know, it's a new system. Right. So, you know, I mean, I'm not doing this whole, I'm not spending all of this time and effort to sell 5,000, you know, units. Right. You're trying you know, to sell We really them. want yeah. this, you know, we really want this thing to go, you know, the way of the Ouya as far as uh, number of units sold. And, um, you know, hopefully, ultimately, you know, have a better product than, than what they ended up. You know, having although there's people that love the UEFA for emulation and stuff. So. Yeah, it's a good little system for that. But I think yeah, that's a good yeah. point that you know you've, you've made it very clear that this is not the Ouya, that this is a very different thing. And I think what's been interesting in following what you've been doing, uh, first of all, you, you're putting in a chip. So this just FPGA chip is actually so this is a processor that's programmable. So it can kind of become anything you want it to be. Is that anything the programmers or the developers want it to be? Whether it's using an existing core for an old system or developers, um, you know, if they want, they can create their own core. Um, and so a lot of people are like, well, that's really difficult and hard. Why would anybody want to do that? Well, because the, the possibilities are endless. I mean, what, what people are going to be able to do with this combination of FPGA and ARM uh, is going to be incredible, we think. And, um, you, you know, and, and maybe some games come out and, and utilize just the FPGA portion of it. Um, 
Maybe some games come out and just use the arm portion of it, but the way that we're designing this thing and the circuitry and everything is these two components can work together and do some really neat things. And once developers can figure out exactly what we're what we're selling here, uh, I think they're going to just have a ton of fun with it. And I think gamers for years and years are just going to reap the benefits uh, of some really cool games. Yeah. Um, and know, if I'm a developer and I want to make a game, like so I go to mm -hmm. you and I say, all right, here's my code. I'm going to you know, put this on a cartridge, and so you, you're going to manufacture these cartridges, and we're yeah, we're manufacturing the cartridges, and you know, cartridge costs. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, that's ridiculous. Cartridges are so expensive these days. Well, I mean, they're really not. <laughs> you know, they're just they're not. They're I chips, mean, right? and and but I mean, these aren't going to be ten, you know, five, ten, fifteen dollar games. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've been telling everybody all along. I mean, our goal is to have some games. You know, maybe they're a smaller kind of a smaller game, bigger than just sort of a quick pick up and play mobile game, or you know, like a, a, a SNES style Genesis game. Maybe a, a it's a new property. Nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody's ever heard of the team that's making it. It's kind of just brand new thing, and it's not proven. You know. Uh, those may come in in the twenty to thirty dollar range, and then you know if it's a, 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 a maybe an original title made by a group of people that that people know and they they played they've made some great games over the years. They're kind of a known commodity. Um, you know they may be more. And certainly if it's a sequel to maybe some sixteen bit classic that we uh, you know arranged to bring onto this system, they may be forty fifty dollars. Um, so, you know, somewhere in that twenty to fifty dollar range is kind of where the games are going to be. Um, you know, these games are getting big these days, these yeah. retro games that are coming out. I mean, uh, Thimbleweed Park from, from Ron Gilbert, and, you know, we're talking to him about bringing his game on this. We're talking to Way Forward about bringing, you know, Shantae onto this and, and Risky's Revenge and Pirate's Curse. And, I mean, these games look retro, but they're massive games, I mean, right. compared to what, what uh, the size of a Genesis Yeah, game. I'm looking at the download uh, size on some of these things. They're, you know, even on the Android and the iOS platform, some of them yeah. are gigabytes in size. So these are not insignificant. And this is yeah. not just like a flash, like a SD card you're sticking in this no, cartridge, right? This is something no. different. Different. No. Well, the deal is, I mean, um, mass ROMs um, are expensive, and they're sort of they've been phasing those out over the years. I mean, there's not many places to get those anymore, and it's small quantities that, are, that they're really, really expensive. Um, but that's great technology. I mean, that's that's the technology that that all the game cartridges, uh, you know, from from the early days in through the '90s, you know, they all use that stuff. Um, hell, maybe the the 3DS is still using mass ROMs. I don't know, of course, but you know, Nintendo buys millions of, of those. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, we're we are having to use some flash technology, but we're using, um, you know, it, you know, they call a hundred year flash. I mean, it's good stuff. You know, it's it's meant to last and and uh, you know have that retention time. You know, well at over 50 years. Wow. Um, and so that's what we're using. And then there's a chance for some of the bigger games because that flash gets really expensive. And you know, when you start getting over maybe 50, 60 megabytes of a game, um, it really starts getting expensive. So then we're thinking about, and this is partly what we're working on now, is some sort of a hard drive system in the cartridge. Um, you know, for uh, and again, but looking at retention, um, you know, twenty year plus on some of this stuff, you know, for the bigger stuff, because uh, it's actually cheaper to put, you know, the hard drive in it. Yeah, it's moving parts. We don't like that, but I mean, There's what are you going to do? I mean, some right. of these games are getting so big. I mean, you can't, you know, if we put some of these games on a hundred year flash, like you know, Shovel Knight, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's going to be a hundred dollar cartridge, right? You no, know, and there may be some people that would pay hundred bucks for that, but not certainly the mass market. So, you know, you you. you we have we can only work with what the current technology is, right? You know, and unfortunately, mass ROMs are, are just not going to work. Although we'd love to use them, um, but it's just it's just you know those would be super expensive cartridges. And this is not, an, uh, and we should point out too, this is not going to be something you're going to run your retro emulators on, right? I mean, it, it, there is the capability, perhaps. The hackers system. will figure it out right. without a doubt because right. of the FPGA in there. I mean, yeah. certainly, you know, it's going to be able to do some really neat things when people, you know, kind of figure it out and tap into it. I mean. But uh, it's really not meant for that. There's, there's so many other ways you can emulate these days. Um, you know, this is really about preserving some great games, um, you know, and, and you know, some games deserve to be preserved. Some don't. Right. Um, there's been lot, lots of great retro titles come out over the last four or five or six years on mobile that you've just totally forgot about. Right. You know, they've come, they've gone, you loved them, right. and they're just gone. Right. You know, now if you still had it on your shelf, it would happen on yourself. Wow, I, I played Super Mega Worm five years ago. I right. love this game. Yeah, you pull it down and put play it, it in again. There. And there'll be some scarcity and too, right? Because you know you're not going to make a gazillion cartridges for every game. It's actually kind of like what it was back in the we're day. We're going to make to order, really. Yeah. So you know, oh, really? we're okay. it's it's yeah. I mean, you know, there's no need to inventory lots of things these right. this the, the, in this day and age. I mean, we can flash the games. 
uh, you know, as their org, ship them out priority mail in the U.S. People get them in two to three days or one to three days, depending on where they're located. Um, you know, we're talking to Fun Stock over in the U.K. about stocking some stuff over there. They want to sell it over there. Um, so, you know, then at least the people in the, in, in the UK and maybe all of Europe, I don't know if they can buy from them. They don't pay the duties and the, the right. high shipping and all of that stuff. Of um, so, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be over there and then, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're going to be pretty smart about how we do this. We're going to be lean and mean. And, um, you know, again, it's just about, uh, bringing the right people on board this thing at the right times, um, I mean, there's been plenty of people over the years that are still out and about looking for things to do uh, that are passionate about this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I mean, we've talked to so many people that, that just love the concept of this and so many people that have been successful in the hardware business, you know, back in the 90s and, and early 2000s, or whatever. Um, I mean, you know, they're still around. These people aren't, you know, dead and gone. I mean, they're, they're out there. And, and so again, using LinkedIn, you know, connecting with these people, um, you know, using contacts, you know, that, that we share connections, you just network around right. and, you know, you kind of build, you know, build a team. But again, you don't want to, you don't want to make it huge right off the bat, no. right? No, I think that was what Uyghur's um, mistake was, is that they, they got all this funding and they became, I think they were probably bigger than they expected to be. And, you know, yeah. you, you got to build that. It's hard. It's very hard. I got a question yeah. from somebody in the chat room, which is relevant yes. to this game discussion. Uh, Master of the Code asks, will the games come in plastic storage cases? Are we going to yes. have a very similar experience? They're going to be clam sh plastic clamshells without a doubt. Awesome. So it's going to be, yes. uh, so you'll be able to stack these up on your shelf. And I guess these are going to be using the, the cartridge molds from the Jaguar also, right? They're going to use the cartridge molds um, from the Jaguar. Um, yes. Um, we've had people wanting to put end labels on these things and everything, which I can understand. <laughs> Um, as we all know, the Jag kind of had that round circular handle up there, which I actually really like. Um, and, you know, to, to modify the tooling it, it, it that much would really cost, at this point, too much money. Right. Um, hey, down the road, if we're rocking and rolling and making lots of money and, and, you know, we can do some of these things and afford to do them, yeah, maybe it's, a, it's an idea. But, you know, um, that and the dust flaps. You know, those are the two People things, the dust, the dust flaps on the Jag. Right, right. You know, I mean, honestly, I've got a Jag. I mean, I've, I mean... It doesn't have a, the original didn't have a dust flap, right? No, it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. But, you know, so far we've said like, you know, we'll, we'll sell a blank cartridge, you just pop a cartridge in it, or you leave yeah. the cartridge you hate the most. Yes, you know, just leave it in the sleep. system, I right? Mean, that's what I used to do when I was a kid. I, my Coleco always had a game in there, even with the dust flap on it. So it was, uh, it was fine like that. So tell me about, you know, just building this hardware. I mean, it's hard, it's not easy to do this. I mean, this is not something you can just go and call somebody up on the phone and say, hey, I want to, I mean, you're, you're designing a pretty complex system here with the FPGA and you've got the ARM chip working in conjunction with it. Um, how did you, is this just these LinkedIn contacts, is that how you got to where you got with this as far as getting the hardware team put together? Um, well, the hardware team, um, hold on one second, sure. is, um, Uh, right, right now, it's it's a pretty small team. We've got two guys, uh, Steve Woida and uh, John Carlson. Steve Woida, um, you know, he goes back. He did uh, some Atari game program. He did he did Quad Run and Taz on the Atari. Uh, then he worked for Tengen during the NES days, and then he went in and did uh, Kid Chameleon on the Sega Genesis. I he worked on Sonic Spinball and uh, Sonic Two. Um, and uh, you know, he's he worked at Apple. I mean, he's he's. Uh, uh, and he's not that old, you know. He's like in his mid fifties, like wow. I said. So, I mean, you know, he he and I have been uh, we we got to know each other years ago through one of my podcasts, and have kind of been friends ever since. And um, I don't know, he and I had this idea for a console a few years ago, actually, even before the magazine. And um, we were talking about making a plug and play controller that you know had new games on SD cards and stuff like that. And and uh, it, then it kind of got tabled, and then I just got into the magazine, and that kind of kicked me out of it for a couple of year, year and a half, and then. And then uh, I was at E3 last year and saw all of these retro games on the floor. And I thought, this is the timing is now. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, like I said before, I mean, it's, it's a genre now. It's being taken in, uh, seriously by the industry. And I think a lot of it goes back to the retro gaming now is an art form. You know, people are making sprite art. And, you know, you got all these developers that grew up on these games. And then now they're making games that pay homage to the games they grew up on. And, and all of this kinds of th all of these types of things are, are kind of uh, sparking this uh, in, you know, retro's been big forever. I mean, don't get me wrong, but it's really getting big now. And uh, so I just thought, hey, now is the time is right. So, you know, I get back with Steve and I said, okay, let's light this thing up again. Um, I found these Jaguar molds. You know, I think maybe that would be a great thing to do. And then I went up there in December of, of you know, just, a, you know, six months ago or whatever and, and did that interview that's sitting on our Facebook page now and kind of trying to document this whole process of, uh, you know, 
uh, just kind of bringing everybody along for the ride. You know, I mean, here's you know, here's the here's what happened to these uh, shells after Atari sold them. It's really cool, and now we've got them, and we've set them up, we've tested them. That it's make they're still making real high quality you know, parts, um, which is amazing to me after, you know, what, 24, 25 yeah. years or whatever. Um, and, um, and so we just, we just lit it back up and then, you know, we were l looking at different ways of, of, you know, what are we going to put inside this thing? Do, you know, I mean, you get the raspberry pie out there and, but you know, we'd get a lot of crap. I think if we just stuck one of those under the hood right. and <laughs> got the beagle, the beagle bone, you know, the beagle bone black and this right. other kind of, uh, you know, system, but I don't know. We, and that was actually a pretty nice, uh, we were going down that road for a few months, actually, until Steve got this idea of the uh, the FPGA. And, uh, you know, when we finally went to the public and kind of revealed that port part of our system, that's when everybody really got interested. There's a lot of people that had written that off, kind of written us off, like, oh, it's just going to be another Android system right. and, it's and not, all of this other stuff. Different. And Mike, where can people find out more information on this? Great, yeah. Right. So uh, we've got our website, which is retrovgs.com. And uh, it is uh, being updated uh, with any new information as uh, there as we have it to tell. It will be there, and then as well as uh, Facebook, uh, which is just facebook.com/retrovgs. Um, there's a lot of action over there. It's a great community. Uh, we do a lot of our game announcements over there. Um, as you may or may not know, we're um, going to have a lot of Kickstarter exclusive colors, translucent cl colors, and and uh, different colors on there that are only going to be available uh, during that Kickstarter uh, campaign. Um, and uh, right now we're just working on bringing some more games up, um, trying to get some exclusives, you know, all that kind of thing, which is really difficult uh, when you're kind of a brand new company nobody's ever heard of, right? Right, right. Um, we, we know, we've got lots of contacts at Konami, Navcom, you know, Capcom, Konami, uh, Sega, and all these places, but, you know, they all want guarantees and, and, and everything else, so it's been a little bit difficult. But um, I think, you know, we really need the fans to get behind this. This is, I think, the one last shot that we've all got. This is it. <laughs> to bring this back. Right. You know, and I guarantee you that if we can get into those Ouya type numbers, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people or more in that campaign period, we will go out and bring back sequels to games that everybody loves. Because uh, we got lots of people. I mean, I'm working with Mike Mike at Other Ocean, and he's done lots of development work for all these other, all these big publishers, and he's got people there. And, um, and you know, uh, these people love the idea, you know, but they don't, you know, right now we don't have a single user, right, until right. this Kickstarter goes. So uh, it's it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Yeah, that we're kind of that's stuck. always the challenge, so, isn't it? And what's so funny, one cool, so it's mm -hmm. cool is that you could, you could have somebody actually make a sequel to the game that they programmed on the Genesis 20 years ago or, or 25 yeah, years right. ago, and you use the same hardware too, right? If they want to do that, they can, you know, unless they want to make it, you know, very similar to that, but make it bigger, you know, have better sound or whatever, but still make it look like that. Um, so, so essentially it looks like a Genesis game, but it's, it's still bigger than what a Genesis game could have been at that time. Um, so we're talking to David Siller. Um, I'm, I just talked with him today. David, uh, you know, worked at Sunsoft. He worked at Capcom. He did some stuff with Iguana Entertainment. Um, you know, he did uh, Arrow the Acrobat. Um, he did Maximo uh, on PS2. Um, he did, um, I mean, you can just uh, do a search for David Siller uh, games and go to his Moby list. There's like, you know, 50 or 60 games that he's worked on, and they're all great games. And so he uh, may be coming on board to uh, design and create um, uh, a new mascot for us and a new mascot platformer for us that we hope that we can maybe announce before the Kickstarter. Uh, so we're really on the fast track for that. And then also keeping him on board uh, to maybe uh, be kind of director of publishing and go out. He, he's he's very well connected developers in Japan. And, and uh, he, you know, all these people that made games in the, in the in the 16-bit era, he knows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of them are either in the industry or not in the industry anymore. Or they're semi-retired and, you know, looking for something to do. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's cool. just a great opportunity to to tap into some of these, you know, brilliant gaming minds that, you know, haven't done anything maybe in the last five or ten years and bring them back. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I want to go out and get big, big time sequels for some of these games that, you know, Streets of Rage or, or a new 16-bit fantasy star or, you know, uh, you know, all these types of, I mean, there's hundreds of games we all want to see brought back. Um, that probably aren't going to happen, you know, on a touchscreen because touchscreens suck for, for retro games. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, do you want to just stream these games or do you want to get it back on cartridge? So this is the perfect platform for these companies, uh, developers who are all looking for any, all, any kind of money they can make these days because they're all hurting. You know, uh, you know, it's not like 
you know, there's, there's, you know, it's just like there's a, another crash coming, right? You got all these games coming out for mobile. Now people are starting to focus more on PC than mobile, which is a really brilliant move, by right, the way. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious. It's a really good move. Yeah, right. mobile's like the worst right now. Oh, it I mean, is. And everything has to be a, free a new developer $2, launching a mobile. Right? They don't pay, people don't yeah. pay for anything on mobile, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really kind of been ridiculous. But um, so, I mean, again, this is a great opportunity. If we, if the fans come, if, 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 if people want this product, um, the Kickstarter is the time to let everybody know that, yes, we want this. We want tangibility back, the culture back, and the collectability back. And, and um, you know, we, we want to own these games. And we don't want to have to download them and all of this kind of crap that goes along with the modern-day gaming world. You know, at least for us retro gamers, we've got this potentially new, really fun platform that, uh, and again, if, the P, if you guys come and you get this, we will bring the developers to this. Um, we have the connections. This is, it's not pie in the sky. We, we know all of these people. Uh, we got connections with the big companies, you know, but uh, we really got to show that there's a demand for this product. So that's, that's, that's really what we're going to be relying yeah. on. Everybody. That's what so. Kickstarter has become is like the, the test bed for all this stuff now to make sure that you can actually deliver. Yeah, the, I mean, hey, it, you know, I think this is a great idea, but if I went to venture capitalist to fund a new cartridge based console, then they they'd, laugh me, right <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. they'd laugh me right out of the room. Yeah, they'd laugh me right out of the room. Now, right. hey, going to them after, you know, we raised, you know, a few million dollars potentially. That's a whole other story. You know, then it's like, okay, we had 30,000 people buy into this in, that, in this 45-day period. So this is real, you know, and we're con going to continue selling pre-orders right after this thing ends for a year until we start delivering this product. And, right. and I mean, this thing could have 50 to 100 launch titles. I mean, think sure. about it. I right. mean, we're launching it now. We're going to, we're, there's already, already some great indie games that we're bringing onto this thing that we'll announce at launch. Uh, we got uh, Adventures of Tiny Night is kind of an exclusive, which is going to be real similar to the Wonder Boy series. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful game. Um, and, uh, but I mean, when the Kickstarter ends, I mean, that's only a 45 day period. We've still got a year, you know, right. before this thing actually ships. Right. That and 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 you know bringing developers on board and and bigger publishers and developers will start seeing that there's some demand here and maybe they'll finally climb on board after the Kickstarter um, once they see there's a market here. So the sky is the limit with this thing. Uh, it really is. So we just really need everybody's support. Uh, if if this is something you want or may have want in the future, there may not be another chance. Right. This is, uh, right, this is our last hope. I'm not hope, just saying right? that to scare people into <laughs> right. buying it. I mean, I no, you're the I only one crazy enough to do it, right? Crazy I mean, that's, enough to do it, yeah. right? So this and, is it. I know, mean, if thankfully it I got some connections and some infrastructure, and, and we got the magazine now to promote it. Right. It's going to be kind of like Nintendo Power. So everybody that gets this console will get the magazine. We'll have you know eight to ten pages in the magazine dedicated to the games coming out, the developers, the game concepts, uh, all this cool stuff having to do with the console. Uh, it's all going to fit together really nicely. So um, you know, it's uh, I think we can all do this, but it's really going to be a, a team effort. Um, you know, in every. In, in every definition of that, I mean, whether it's the consumers and the buyers, the people that want this system, uh, the people that want to turn gaming into a new direction, right? Right. I mean, this is really what we're asking. So, it, and it's a lot to ask. Um, but uh, you know, we we hope that it's going to be a compelling product. And and uh, when we get the Kickstarter video going, and you see who's all on the team, and we make more some more game announcements. Uh, I think people are going to get pretty excited about it. So well, it's only getting cool. started. And it plugs into your HD television too, right? So you don't need to keep a CRT around for that. It'll plug into either one. Okay, great. So, oh, yeah. new and old. Perfect. So it does, does yeah, it all. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for uh, coming on the channel tonight. Great. Thank you for having me on the show. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to learn any more or talk to me, you can reach out to us through the Facebook page or my email address, which is uh, mkennedy, like the president, mkennedy, at retrovgs.com. Perfect. And we will put all those links down below in the video description, also on the recording. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, I apologize for the stream issues, but uh, that's why we record these things too as a fallback. So that will do it for this evening. Uh, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.